Strategies. This panel will be led and moderated by Mr. Gordon Lubold. Gordon is a Pentagon reporter for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, he has reported and worked in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, across the Middle East and Central Asia, as well as from Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America and East Asia. He's launched and authored three different national security newsletters for three outlets, including Situation Report. Very lucky and happy to have Gordon moderate this excellent third panel. Gordon, the floor is yours. Thanks, Thanks so sir. Much. Thanks so much. Uh, uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, great to be here. It's an honor to uh, be talking about this important issue. It, it seems to me that uh, this morning you heard about the threat and the impact uh, of, of, of mines and IEDs. You talked about uh, uh, the tools available to counter all of that. But as uh, anything, certainly in Washington, it comes down to policy and prioritizing policy and uh, how to make an effective policy to, 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 make, uh, to make a real impact. Um, so what I wanted to do is uh, uh, briefly, very briefly, like introduce everybody, recognizing that you've got uh, your, your uh, folders uh, with you to read the full bios of, of the panel up here. But what we've got is representatives from state, uh, the Pentagon, the UN, and uh, an NGO uh, to talk about this kind of uh, uh, frame of this issue. Um, so, and so what I'm going to do is just introduce you, uh, each of you, and then uh, what I'd like to do is to kind of keep a somewhat brief uh, intro um, so that we can get to some questions, because uh, I just think that you guys have probably the best questions, better than mine maybe, probably, um, and uh, it's a great way to engage everybody. Um, but what I was hoping you could do is kind of introduce yourselves, actually just introduce yourselves, but we'll start down at the end with Stan. Um, uh, but you know, tell us <laughs> kind of what you do, who you are, uh, the role you play, and what we need to know about how you're thinking about the problem. Stan, please go ahead. All right, you're just sitting, it's fine. Okay, all right. Uh, my name is Stan Brown, and I work at the Department of State. I am the director of the Office of Weapons Removal and Abatement uh, at the department. And we are the office that uh, leads and manages the uh, Department of State's uh, conventional weapons destruction program. So we are uh, pro uh, we are focused on the program, uh, the policies, uh, and uh, also the Man Pass Task Force on shoulder fired missiles. But on the issue as it relates today, we're the office that's overseeing these programs and working with our implementing partners in the field, uh, contractors, uh, and uh, international NGOs to remediate the IEDs and explosive remnants of war uh, in. Uh, uh, specifically uh, the Middle East for today's conversation. I want to kind of cover some points associated uh, uh, with the work that's ongoing um, and first say that I'd like to thank the Middle East Institute for putting together this uh, discussion because it is very uh, relevant and you're going to see by some of the numbers I'm going to throw out there that uh, the United States is taking this fairly seriously and a lot of our uh, budgetary effort is going uh, uh, toward uh, remediating this. So I, uh, IEDs in the HMA world, the humanitarian mine action world, are, are nothing new in some regards. The United States has uh, provided uh, $3.2 billion over, uh, since 1993 to over 100 countries uh, to help uh, in the assistance to remediate this type uh, these types of threats. Over that time uh, span, the contracts and NGOs that we fund have regularly dealt with IEDs, whether that is in Afghanistan, uh, where there's homemade mines, Sri Lanka, uh, improvised claymores, uh, and other areas. However, with the uh, rise in, uh, of ISIS and the fall, uh, the wreckage left in their wake of IEDs was, uh, as you heard this morning, uh, was targeting civilians. I mean, it was much beyond the military utility of IEDs. So, uh, you know, United States is the largest CWD donor uh, to activities in Iraq, and we have provided $450 million since 1993, but more specifically since 2015, we have provided over $176 million in Iraq, uh, especially in this effort to defeat ISIS. Um, as, uh, along with that same time frame, we have also provided around $80 million in Syria uh, to, uh, to, for the same effort. Uh, 
Uh, humanitarian action in areas uh, liberated from ISIS uh, is a top priority for the U.S. For the U.S., uh, if you look at the provinces in Anbar, Nineveh, and Iraq, uh, and you look at the northeast parts of uh, Syria, and then certain Libya, uh, we are continuing to work there at, uh, at with a significant number of re amount of resources. When it comes to uh, ERW and these liberated areas, IEDs are the predominant threat to uh, returning populations and assistance workers. While IEDs aren't a new concept in humanitarian mine action in the humanitarian mine action world. The context in which we're clearing them is. Traditional humanitarian mine action was strictly a post-conflict effort. Uh, we, many times that effort would start maybe years after the conflict is, had ended. Uh, the concentration, uh, the use of IEDs and the concentration of IEDs has demanded a much more rapid response. And so we find ourselves uh, working in uh, quite frankly, in the middle of conflict, and that's one of the drivers of the cost of this work. Where uh, you know we were able to do that, and, and through the international NGOs, humanitarian neutrality, they were able to work with both sides of the conflict. We're working in environments now where the security situation dictates that some of our implementing partners, like Janus and Tetra Tech and others, have to have a security arm uh, to be able to work in areas where they're working. Um, we're also seeing that clearing IEDs in urban areas is far more complex. Uh, it requires a, uh, a certain level of expertise for some of the devices that we're encountering. Uh, the pace of the work is slower, uh, and it's much more expensive. You need a, you need a certain expertise at EOD tech level. Um, there's, like I said, the proximity to the fighting. Sometimes the security cost is upwards of 50% of the cost of doing the work. Uh, and. Uh, uh, and 340 million thus far uh, from the U.S. coffers has gone to Syria and Iraq alone in this effort. Uh, the scope of a problem is huge. Uh, I mean, you've heard everyone talk about that. It's, uh, we've heard conversations saying that it, uh, uh, it exceeds what we've seen sometimes in World War II. Uh, th and again, the devices weren't left because they were being used for military purposes. They were left uh, to uh, intentionally harm civilians. So part of this is understanding how long this is going to take. Uh, and, and that is about educating populations, about educating uh, political leadership in different places so that we have an expectation that we assign the priority to the task and that uh, we look at the risk and we look at the programmatic budget scheduling that is required to address these issues in a, uh, in a methodical way uh, is required. Uh, national mine action authorities in these countries where they exist uh, in many cases don't have the capacity uh, to do that and in some cases uh, uh, don't exist. Uh, they're just not there to do it. Uh, sometimes they don't understand the full con uh, context of dealing with IEDs for, versus our traditional humanitarian mine action programs. Uh, and uh, very often uh, at the beginning of these issues, they don't have the expertise uh, resident in country to be able to do the work that we're trying to help them with. Uh, humanitarian mine action in itself uh, was, was an end into itself to a certain degree. You know, clearance efforts prioritized those areas where we saw uh, the highest uh, civilian casualties and we were able to do uh, baseline surveys, uh, execute that work, uh, and it was very, uh, it took a, a, lot, a while but it was very effective uh, in moving the devices. Well, uh, humanitarian mine action uh, in the uh, context of what we're seeing in uh, Syria and Iraq in the defeat ISIS fight is not an end unto itself. Uh, the action itself, the work that we're doing itself is to able follow along stabilization so that we can, and US priorities, clear critical infrastructure so that uh, uh, IDPs can return home. Uh, and that is why we've, you've heard the discussion about uh, why we chose a critical infrastructure as the priority. Uh, it's because we know that clearing a hospital that serves a large number of people, clearing water treatment hospitals, even bakeries to open markets where people can uh, eat, uh, schools, uh, religious institutions serve a large number of the communities. Not saying that uh, having a residence uh, safe is not important, but just in looking at finite resources, 
uh, we proceeded in the uh, in the way of uh, clearing critical infrastructure. So uh, what we see is the work that we're doing is a critical link between the end of kinetic operations uh, and and uh, and the follow-on st stabilization. This must be done by largely the international community. Uh, so it uh, also means a shift in a practical approach. Uh, speed is of the essence. Uh, we're having to go faster on the ground. Uh, resources are finite and they go quickly. When I tell people, I often tell them that we're, as we're sitting here today, I'm spending about 270 to 280,000 today on Syria and Iraq. Uh, and so it is very expensive. Uh, and uh, uh, we need to make sure that we're shepherding those resources to meet those priorities. So it takes uh, a, uh, a lot of work to work with our partners on the ground, civilian authorities, our implementers, to make sure that resources are going to what needs to be done. And, and we talked about that a little bit this morning. So again, it goes back to doing the water pumping stations, electrical substations, hospitals, schools and universities, multi-family housing uh, structures, uh, facilities producing construction materials like cement factories, key transportation uh, routes and things of that nature. Um, so we're, we're constantly working uh, to temper uh, sometimes potentially unrealistic expectations. Uh, there are a lot of stabilization stakeholders uh, in this process. Um, and, and they all have opinions. Uh, uh, is it good enough, uh, good enough? Well, we've heard that before. Or don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. But at the end of the day, uh, we must clear to a level and IMAS standards such that the stabilization entities can provide the follow-on work that needs to be done. If those entities are entering these areas and they're being harmed by devices that have been left, that has the potential to stall the entire stabilization process. So uh, we are very cautious and, and conscious of that issue and, uh, and want to make sure that the work is being done appropriately. Uh, and I'll leave you with this point, uh, to save time here, but the hard reality is IEDs, UXO, and other ERW will persist for years in areas liberated by ISIS. It will take a sustained, concerted effort uh, to, uh, to solve this problem. It's not a problem that is going to be solely solved by the United States or the international communities. Uh, country, host countries are going to have to take ownership of this problem. They're going to, uh, as we're helping them with this now, we're, they're going to need to embrace the fact that we're helping them build capacity uh, to handle this problem uh, for local ownership in the future. Uh, if you just look at World War II as a, an example, uh, you see that Europe, London, uh, um, the UK, Germany, and other countries are still finding ordinance now from those uh, uh, from World War II, and they have to have the capacity to be able to deal with that in the future. So with that, I'll leave you, and uh, again, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, participate and speak to you about this issue. Stan, thanks so much. We'll go now to Mark Swain from the Pentagon, if you just properly introduce yourself and yep. go for it. Well, <clears throat> good morning. Thank you. Thank you all for coming and listening to us today. I think this is a really important issue. Uh, where I work in the Pentagon, I work for Secretary Mattis in the Office of the Secretary of Defense for Policy. Uh, my position is the Acting DASD Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Stability and Humanitarian Affairs. I work under the Assistant Secretary for SOLIC Special Operations. He's got three DASDs, counterterrorism, counter drugs, and uh, stability and humanitarian affairs. So we have drugs, thugs, and hugs. So I'm the hugs person. <laughs> I kind of have a big bubble, so I don't really like to hug, but I do like people and I like helping humanitarian issues. And I think it's an important part for the Department of Defense. In our office, we also cover EOD, Explosive Ordnance Disposal, and uh, we can sit here and talk about all of the things the Department of Defense does for our force, for Explosive Ordnance Disposal. All the services have EOD officers and NCOs who do great jobs wherever our soldiers and uh, sailors and airmen and Marines are deployed. Um, we also work closely with uh, what used to be JIADO and JIDA. Um, and that office has be best practices of how the U.S. military can uh, counter IEDs and uh, deal with uh, ERW, um, explosive remnants of war. But uh, there's two specific programs that my office oversees. You heard from one of them, Sean Burke, earlier today, that uh, focus in the humanitarian space. Um, and those two areas that, that we have are uh, 
using our ODACA funds. The first one is uh, Overseas Humanitarian Assistance and Civic Aid, and we have uh, a portion of that is around $100 million a year that the Department of Defense focuses on humanitarian assistance. But Congress allows us and asks us to spend $15 million, up to $15 million, towards humanitarian mine action. So that humanitarian mine action is a program, both programs, we work closely with the State Department to kind of de-conflict. Our programs are smaller than what Stan has in state, but we, we talk frequently and uh, we try to make sure that we get the best effect for a holistic approach of how we would approach something uh, as a government and uh, where DOD and state can either work together or de-conflict so that we're not overlapping and, and wasting taxpayers' money. Uh, the Humanitarian Mine Action Program uh, is run out of Fort Lee. Uh, John Green out there uh, works at uh, Humanitarian uh, HDTC, the training center, uh, the Humanitarian Demining Training Center, and again, we spend uh, up to $15 million a year, and we work with partner militaries to train those militaries in uh, all of the areas of demining and uh, that we can go over. And they do that throughout the globe. Uh, they do that with eight people, and we work really hard and spend a lot of time working with our partners in areas where our combatant commanders throughout the world, in this area where you most focus on is uh, Central Command, and we work with uh, the Central Command and to determine where the best places uh, for DOD's contributions to this humanitarian mine action and where we can uh, get a, build a partner capacity for uh, tackling that uh, difficult situation of mines in their area. The, the second one was what Sean Burke was up here discussing earlier, the humanitarian demining research and development. That's a little bit smaller of a program, about $10 million a year. They work uh, very closely with our NGO partners. Uh, many of you are in the room today uh, that have benefited from Sean's work and we're really proud of that the Department of Defense spends time uh, taking basically off-the-shelf technologies, providing some research and development to enhance what is out there and to allow uh, your great organizations uh, to enhance your ability to uh, affect and make a positive effect on those uh, areas that need to be demined. Uh, we can get into the particulars of what the programs do, um, but suffice it to say, I've been in my office now for four years. We had those two programs were uh, two different programs that were compatible but never really worked together. What we're trying to do is have HDTC out of Fort Lee and uh, Sean Burke's team at Fort Belvoir uh, see where they can work together to, to get a better effect and we're already doing that in some Pacific areas and, and UCOM areas and we'll see if where we can uh, work in CENTCOM next. Uh, some of you have also uh, have worked in, in Syria with the issue of uh, the ERW in Syria well, we work closely with state. Uh, DOD has also used a separate fund, the CT, CTEF, which is the Counter ISIS Train and Equip Fund. We have, as a department, trained the RISF, the Raqqa Internal Security Forces, in uh, their ability to uh, counter IEDs and uh, go after those ERW that are in the, in the area. So, again, uh, uh, DOD has uh, two basic humanitarian programs. We do a lot with our own force, and then sometimes we have special funding and authorities where we can uh, assist partners specifically, again, for Syria, and we really work closely with uh, the state and what we do, and we're very happy to have programs that work with the NGOs uh, to enhance your ability. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, Nanette Kelly from the UN Relief Agency, please. Please. Yeah, I'm going to come up here. Um, just a clarification, I'm from the Refugee Agency. Um, some of you may know of us. We deal with um, helping refugees around the world, but also internally displaced persons. And I want to say up front that we're not experts in, in the topics that we're discussing today, but of course, the consequences of landmines and unexploded ordnance are something we deal with on a daily basis. And in that, we have to deal with, in partnership with all of you, with our technical experts, with our UN lead agencies, with the NGOs that you've heard, MAG is being one of them, um, and with our government partners whose uh, donorship also would not be able, would, without which we wouldn't be able to do 
what we do. Um, I'm starting with this picture because, uh, you know, classically we say a picture speaks a thousand words, but this is how um, the effects of, of, of landmines and explosive devices really touch us. This little girl, she's actually from uh, Syria, she's now in Lebanon, she's holding her mom's prosthetic leg. I, I, I think it speaks quite a bit about the consequences of, of, of what we're dealing with. In fact, we produced our um, statistics in June of, la of this year showing that they, we are now 68 million people are forcibly displaced in the world. And when you look at some of the largest countries of, of conflict that is producing these high numbers, they're also the most contaminated with the devices that we're talking about today. Syria, Afghanistan, Yemen being among them. And one thing that may not be always um, readily recognized by people is that refugees, when they flee, when they do move to another country, it's often after several incidents in their own. They move from one place to another. And the precipitating incident that causes them to leave their own country is usually a bomb or some other kind of explosive device. So it's often the precipitating reason for flight, but sadly, it's also a threat they incur while they're fleeing. We, in, in the Syria context, we had uh, people who would arrive in, in Lebanon where I served prior to my current job, which is now representing UNHCR at the UN headquarters. Uh, we would receive people who, in flight, um, were uh, landed on a, uh, on a landmine and arrived really severely wounded. It also happened um, people fleeing from Syria into Turkey, but it happens around the world. This one, uh, this photo actually is in Iraq, and these are the old minefields that the ambassador was referring to earlier. So in successive waves of internal displacement, it also was a hazard to people fleeing. And this um, will be familiar to some of you. This is the 1,400 mile border of uh, West and Western Sahara that looks very peaceful right now but is littered with landmines. And we have 3,000 3, persons who are in our refugee camps there, the most desolate, I think, in all the world, who have uh, suffered injuries as account of, on account of those. This picture um, is meant to illustrate that it's not only the precipitating reason for flight or a risk in flight, but sometimes your destination country also contains risks. And for those who are familiar with Lebanon, you'll, 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 this, these, this map will, will be one that's well known to you. Uh, Lebanon sits very nicely within the state of Connecticut. I believe it's about the same size. It has four million people and it's received over a million refugees. And they were coming in uh, over a two or three year period when I was there at 10,000 a week. And initially they were, you see the red zone, that's the Becca Valley, they were coming into that part of the country. But they slowly spread throughout the whole country, including in the southern areas, which are, you can't see so well from this blow up, but the brown dots are the areas that are very were very heavily mined, um, especially after the 2006 uh, war with Israel. So we were facing, and, and these refugees were facing, as were the local communities, this huge influx. People who needed shelter, who needed homes, who needed who needed health care and, and food, and yet also faced uh, risks of where they were settling. I, I also wanted to show you this as just a representative um, reminder of the kind of um, isolation that persons who have suffered a, a landmine incident or an, un, a, an explosive hazard, what they, what they incur. In, an, in, an, in a host country, we have great difficulty trying to meet the very basic needs of most people. And persons who have been severely injured, their vulnerability is much, much deeper. Uh, healthcare funding for in a humanitarian situation can basically serve as some um, 
at most we try to do health saving needs. We're constantly trying to prioritize across equally compelling needs. And so the kinds of rehabilitation, the prosthetics that people need is very far down the list in terms of what we're often able to do, which means that people, young people, job earning, uh, persons with job earning potential, they're very isolated in their own homes. They can be prevented from going to school, from, from earning a livelihood. And it's a, it's a huge challenge that, that we face. Um, and of course, many of you have mentioned that when it comes time to return home, of course, the presence of all these uh, landmines and explosive hazards is a great deterrent to return. I would like to mention it's not the only deterrent but it's a significant one. And we just did a recently an intention survey of Iraqi um, internally displaced persons and 21% of them said that it was because of those hazards, that was the primary reason they couldn't return home. So it's significant and it's, a, it, it's, it's an issue that really hastens the prolong, prolongation of, of displacement. This picture moves me quite a bit. It was taken by a very gifted photographer. It appeared in The Guardian. It was an expose on Mag's work, I believe. And um, just these are three children who are playing with explosive, or five children. Three of them the next day were dead because they had taken a bomb and thrown it into a fire. And I wish I could say that is the only story, or this is an isolated story, but I think, as you all know, it's, it's a hugely uh, relevant one. And it, so children are very um, often the, um, some of the chief victims, but as are farmers who are going to tend land, um, as well as adults who are going to forage for metals and, and, and things in the destruction of, of war. That's a picture from Afghanistan. These little girls actually also in the same expose are playing on a tank while their father is searching for weapons inside the tank, completely oblivious to the dangers around them. And these are little boys, they were playing soccer with a scrap piece of metal that turned into to be an explosion and, and you can see the consequences of that. It uh, speaks to actually these went the, those slides really speak to the need for education. There was a question about whether or not we we're doing education with children. In fact, education is a huge um, uh, aspect of all of our work. Who, those of us who are in the humanitarian field and, and others as well, uh, so surveys show that 98% in Syria of the persons of victims of landmine disasters were persons who hadn't received training, and the. Um, the, the different facets of way, how you can do this are, 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 are huge. So we do it in schools, we train trainers, we do, go out into communities, we do it in community centers, we do it with local authorities. Um, the uh, training and education is a, huge, um, is a huge element of prevention. This speaks actually to what happens to those who do have uh, the effects of, who have suffered a, an attack. This is a, a man who has been supported to take up his tailoring business because they do have contributions to make and when we can do that we, we, we severely we are able to significantly overcome their own disabilities. Uh, I love this picture. This is another Syrian man who lost both his legs inside Syria and he's now one of our most effective community outreach volunteers. Here he is with his wife. They go and deliver community programs to refugees throughout Lebanon. It's just to say, um, not to forget, that it's not just about clearing, um, it's not just about creating places where people can return safely, but it's also a question about rehabilitating lives so that persons can also contribute significantly to their communities. And in closing, I, I would just point out that I think Lise did a really nice job of, issue, of, of talking about what we need. And it's, those themes have been reiterated a lot this morning in terms of the preventative work, the capacity building of others, the education. And, and i just like to close in terms of the partnership. We all bring different things to the table, but clearly we can't do it alone. And so to be in a room with so many partners that's working on this dedicated cause really gives, gives me hope. Hope. I hope it does for you as well. Thanks, Annette. General, please. Um, I'm going to follow Nunette and, and use the stand, but I'm going to do the same as the others and 
deviate from my notes because I think a lot of what we've heard today has already been said and I think it's best to try and pick out the things that matter. I am the Chief Executive of the HALO Trust. My name's James Cowan and I've worked for HALO for the last three years. HALO uh, employs 9,000 deminers around the world. Uh, we're in 25 countries and territories and we view this uh, crisis, this threat, this challenge in the Middle East as the principal area for the development of HALO in the years to come. I used to be a soldier. I, I served first in Northern Ireland. I regret to say that there's no honour in acronyms, but the IED comes out of the Northern Ireland campaign of the 1970s, 80s and 90s. I served in the Balkans, which was largely about landmines proper, but I then really came of age as a soldier in the Iraq campaign as a commanding officer of my battalion, where most of my soldiers killed were to IEDs. I commanded a brigade in Afghanistan in Helmand, where again half of the soldiers of the 64 of my soldiers killed were killed by IEDs, and I finished commanding a division. So I have a, a feel for this problem, both as the, the director of a humanitarian organization, but as someone who has practiced in these areas. So I'd like to begin with a quote uh, from that old Prussian Karl von Clausewitz, the, the first, the supreme responsibility of a commander is to understand the nature of the conflict with which he's engaged, neither mistaking it for or turning it into something that's alien to its nature. What concerns me about this discussion today is a tendency towards applying templated solutions to all of these countries. Each one of them is very different. Each one of them needs to be considered on its own terms. The war in Iraq is largely a campaign of reconquest by the Iraqi government with its American and other allies. The war in Syria is a campaign of reconquest by the government of Syria with its ally, Russia. These are very different things. The conflicts in Libya, in Yemen, in Somalia are largely about ungoverned, ungoverned territory to one extent or another. The conflict in Afghanistan is largely because neither the Taliban, or to a lesser degree ISIS, uh, can conquer Afghanistan, and the government of Afghanistan cannot reconquer Afghanistan. So you have very different challenges in each of these countries. So to apply a single template to any of them I think is dangerous and should be avoided. But there are certain things which I think are of interest and we can consider. I was very interested by General Wolfe's description of the blended solution. And I personally, as an organisation, as the leader of HALO, buy into that and wish to be part of that solution. But I do think that blended solution can only work for obvious reasons in a country where uh, the government is friendly to those coalition partners who are supporting it. Clearly, a blended solution in the context of Syria would not be appropriate. There are, of course, other areas outside of Syrian control in Turkish areas or Kurdish, would, which would lie outside of that particular categorization. But we need to take each of these problems on their own terms. I was then very interested in the descriptions that I heard of the IED and its relationship with the landmine. Well, again, I think there are dangers in overgeneralizing. It seems to me that the IED is almost an unhelpful term. It can come in so many shapes and forms, something that the IRA posts you uh, through a letterbox, through to a truck bomb. Things that cover this huge breadth are not necessarily helpful. But what we're seeing largely in the Middle East is the wholesale production of relatively cheap technology which are victim operated. And these things are, in effect, homemade landmines. And because they are homemade landmines, they can be dealt with in that particular context. Where they are command initiated, where they are more complex, then there's a different set of rules that apply. We need to be able to break out this problem and not generalise about it. I think there are dangers in so doing. But at the heart of this, and coming back to that quote from Clausewitz, lies this question of consent. Is there consent for any party to be able to operate there to clear these devices safely? If such consent exists because of reconquest in the way I've just described it, then I think, in a sense, it's compulsory consent that's been achieved. There may also be voluntary consent because it's possible in the context in, in Afghanistan to negotiate uh, with an armed opposition group and to gain 
that humanitarian space to operate there. Again, we need to take each of these circumstances on their own merits. But there are other very practical, technical issues which we need to think about. We've heard a lot of uh, very interesting and novel solutions today, but we do need to root this in the practical and the pragmatic. What we're dealing with largely in the Middle East is a conflict fought in urban areas. Much of the technology that was previously used in the classic landmine campaigns of the 80s and 90s were appropriate for a, a rural rather than urban environment. There's a whole swathe of new technology that's now being trialled, and we've heard a lot about it today, and I'm extremely grateful. I'd like to put on record my thanks, particularly to the United States government, for its support of HALO and other such NGOs in developing that technology. We want to be part of that solution, uh, and we wish to work with you as a partner to resolve these problems. It isn't just about the technological solutions, it's the tactics and techniques that accompany those solutions. How do we prioritize? Is it key infrastructure? At what point do we get uh, communities back into their homes? How do we go about doing that? All sorts of interesting legal issues beginning to arise surrounding ownership of homes. If we have to destroy a home, who has the liability for that home if it has to be rubberized as a, as a result of our work? All these things need to be thought through. It isn't simply in the technological space that we need to focus our work. And because we are a community of uh, uh, mine action people, we do tend to uh, talk in a technical rather than broader sense. And I would like to see the debate broadened with that in mind. I'd also like to think about longevity as a final point. The war in the Middle East has now gone on longer than anyone's experience of the Second World War. That Second World War was horrific in terms of its intensity, but we're now seeing generations that have been subjected in the Middle East who've literally grown up with IEDs and other explosive ordnance, and it may last for generations to come. This may be a hundred years war that we're dealing with. How do we operate in such an environment? How do we sustain ourselves as organizations for the long term? We tend to be funded for specific programs which last perhaps months, perhaps years, but never do we think in terms of decades. The HALO Trust invests a lot of money in training its staff. Uh, that investment is something we pay for ourselves, and I'm pretty proud of the fact that HALO has seeded the broader mine action world to such a very considerable degree. But I would like donors to start thinking for the long term. How do we get set up in order to manage this tremendous humanitarian problem, not just for the next few months or years, but potentially for decades. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, General Cowan. Great uh, intros there. I would just, I, I really actually do want to get to uh, audience questions, but a couple, uh, a couple broad ones. I just wondered if whoever wants to jump in could jump uh, could speak to the the particular challenges uh, geographically and the different conflicts that we see here particularly all the time from Washington um, changing nature of the conflict uh, in Syria um, uh, jury's still out on how Afghanistan is going to unfold but geographically where are the bigger challenges in this effort and then kind of separate question uh, from a policy standpoint you know the, the policy table is so cluttered, uh, again here in Washington, um, putting the political dramas even aside, um, is there enough focus on this problem and where, where could the improvements be made? So broad, eight broad questions for anybody to jump in. Stan, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in you first. You get to go first. <laughs> So, and I agree totally with James uh, on the issue of uh, every situation that we're going in, every country, every solution is a different solution or, or a problem that requires a specific solution to the situation. So when you look, at, let's just take Iraq and Syria for instance when you're talking in your, in your question. Uh, when I uh, compare Iraq and Syria, in Iraq we had a, uh, a central government, we had local governance, we had a UN uh, presence there. Uh, we had uh, at least uh, um, entities that we could work with that had some background or police training or military training in loosely in EOD. And so there were entities that we could engage immediately. When you compare that to Syria, we didn't, uh, especially as uh, 
policy in a northeast Syria uh, geographic region, we didn't have those entities on the ground. We didn't have a ready-made force. We did not have a initial UN presence there. We did not have other entities that we had seen in other countries to be able to work with. So uh, in that context, it was much harder to identify and train and bring together a demining force in Syria. Uh, but in both cases, uh, quite frankly, due to the entrepreneurship and, and uh, expeditionary nature of our implementing partners like Janus, Tetra Tech, MAG, uh, Halo, and others, uh, they were able to solve some of those things, but it makes it uh, it makes it difficult. Uh, it, it, that's a challenge within itself. That's a challenge on the on the policy side, the broader Syria policy, uh, and and the way forward with that, and and ultimately will be probably solved in a Geneva uh, context uh, of the civil war there. So. As we look at these issues, and then I look at Libya, where. Uh, because the Libyan government needed training, they wanted that context of their uh, assistance from the U.S. government to be uh, limited to training Libyan uh, entities to be able to do the work there. And obviously we see in the, uh, the ongoing conflict in Yemen, we're not yet there uh, doing the type of work that Les Grand was saying that's going to be so sorely needed. So uh, the geographic uh, challenges uh, exist. Uh, every country needs a different approach based on the situation that's ongoing there. And uh, at the end of the day, the most successful programs has an entity on the ground that we can work with, uh, whether it's the local authorities in Syria or their central governments in Iraq. From my perspective, in uh, the Department of Defense, when I first started, a lot of times that we worked in the, especially the humanitarian demining area, it was uh, Years after a conflict had ended, we were trying to address uh, mines in the ground, and uh, now, in the last four years, I would say, uh, with the countering IEDs and then ERW, uh, it's it's, just, it's, cha it's changing a little bit in the, in the phase and uh, maybe some of the geographic location. But when you have uh, ISIS who was planning. Uh, Explosive remnants of war, you think of that's, that's an unexploded ordinance that's laying on the ground after the battle, but when someone takes an explosive and, and puts, makes it a booby trap and puts it in, inside a home so that when somebody walks in to open the door or lift something up, that uh, it, it kills the people who are uh, just trying to get back into their homes. That's uh, uh, a different style, and I think that there's a lot of NGOs who are working closer to the fight, not years after the fight was over, but close thereafter, after a, uh, and Syria is a very good example of after uh, an area is cleared of ISIS, um, the international community is trying to work in, in that area to uh, make sure that the, the cities and villages are uh, able for people to return to. And uh, when people are planning booby traps and, and IEDs, uh, that's something that uh, as a international community who focuses in this area, we have to uh, deal with and we, the, I think the, you all are doing a lot of it closer to uh, post-conflict and uh, that, that puts you more at risk. So that, that's the one where it's changed, I believe. Just quickly refine the question for, for you two if I could, but like, does the uncertainty of U.S. foreign policy and military policy in some of these places pose particular challenges for what you see you're doing? Well, the main problem, that, the, the biggest challenge that we have is that conflicts are not being mitigated or resolved. And we haven't talked about that today at all, but there's a crisis in accountability internationally. That's not unique to any particular government. We've got a security council where I observe all the time where it's uh, agreement on how to resolve any of these conflicts is is, is just doesn't exist. So that's, for us, the biggest problem. Then even when a situation, the conflict has ended, and, and again, I mentioned this, and I don't want to distract us, but the, the, ins, the, the issues of landmines and unexploded ordinances and hazards is huge, but there's 
lots of other problems as well, like reconstruction it, itself, um, whether or not pre persons believe that this, the, the security is going to be long lasting. I mean, Iraq has been discouraging for so many people who did return only to be displaced again. Um, people don't have ID documents, they don't have their land and property documents in order to be able to go home and claim. Uh, there are tensions between the communities that have left, you have to build that up. It's an enormous exercise and you can't have that until you have the situation stabilized, a peaceful conflict resolved, and then all these other elements have to come into play. So the challenges are quite enormous and they're not due to one particular government's foreign policy. Okay. John. I think um, exhorting the Secu Security Council to work together is a bit like exhorting the clouds not to rain on you. It's not likely to happen. Um, the question is whether individual countries have consistent foreign policies. I do think, in fact, the United States has been consistent in its approach to Iraq um, in the last few years, and that consistency is paying off, and the country is benefiting from the campaign that has taken place. I think the United States' recommitment to Afghanistan and that of other allies is also extremely helpful. Um, the decision to leave Afghanistan in 2014 uh, was not helpful. Um, I think, though, there are other countries where lack of clarity is a real problem. I think the, the situation in Libya is a very good example. And, of course, the big uh, question is how the West will now respond to um, a resurgent Syria, which is slowly reconquering that territory, which does not uh, belong, uh, is not held by either Kurds or Turks. And the West is yet to resolve how it wants to address that because there is a massive humanitarian challenge within a Syrian regime held territory, uh, which we would like to help with, but we can't do so unless either donors wish to fund us or the sanctions regime allows it. Thank you. Let's open it up, otherwise I'm a liar and we'll never get to your questions, so let's just jump, jump in. Ma'am, please. Right here. I don't know if, uh, are, do we have microphones? Yes. Yeah, someone's coming right here. Thank you. Thanks to the panel for this nice presentation. And, and I also heard you talk about accountability. The problem is just touch the outside rather than really invest the inside. And currently, even in the United States, we talk about the human rights, we talk about social problems. Most likely, they are not really reach out to benefit those who we are supposed to say they are recipients, supposedly, but it's not. So it's really resource diverted. The government is really by the, or planned by the bad people. I want to use a layman language so you understand it. So in the United States, you have a lot of problem, and so they send other people to the jail when they are really innocent. And by employment, it's supposed to be number is supposed to be good, but actually employment is really negative productivity. So government abuse everything is possible, then we make our society worse. So I just wonder if we can establish a good accountability really based on the basic just and peace concept to investigate whether the resources go to the right place and so prevent all the war, all the disaster in the humanity. I just wonder if you can investigate each of your department. Now I know almost every agency now they have PPP program. Here, let, me, let me just pop in. Can you um, just uh, either somebody right, react I, or right. ask I just a real if question? If you can go into investigate that PPP program, which is reflect the extreme fraud and crime and the abuse of power that create all the social problems in the United States and overseas. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, why don't we jump around to a few different questions, and then if some, unless somebody wants to uh, jump in, I wasn't sure. Um, let's get to the back here, uh, gentleman in the white shirt, please. And if somebody wants to react to the to the first one, Hi, they can. Thanks. Uh, I'm Namo Abdullah with Rudao Media Network from Kurdistan in Iraq. So I uh, have a question for Mr. Brown of the U.S. Uh, you said since 2015 the State Department has allocated 176 million dollars for demining purposes. 
Uh, but uh, the problem is like uh, Sinjar, for example, which is a small town, which was a small town of nearly 80,000 people, remains uncleared of landmines, even though it was liberated in 2015. So one could uh, rightly wonder where all that money was spent. Uh, does the United States set goals for uh, the NGOs or organizations that uh, it support it uh, funds? Thanks. Okay. No, thank you for your question. So, uh, so in the in Iraq specifically, as you said, uh, and I stated earlier, from 2015 to 2017, we spent about 176 million dollars uh, toward. Uh, uh, the effort to clear uh, improvised explosive devices that were left by ISIS. Our, our priority uh, initially obviously has been to clear critical infrastructure. So that so a lot of the resources in the initial response has gone and continues to go to establishing and, and clearing the critical infrastructure to get those things back up and working. As I stated earlier, you know, electrical grids, water, uh, hospitals, things of that nature. Uh, most recently, uh, I don't know if you uh, saw this, but the secretary uh, in the areas in Nineveh, especially where there has been a lot of uh, groups that were particularly targeted by ISIS, uh, the secretary of state just uh, announced that uh, we uh, were notifying to Congress $17 million um, for work specifically in the areas around Sinjar and other areas in the Nineveh provinces. And that is uh, going to be primarily focused in some of the rural areas uh, to try to get that back up and running. We have not seen that money in our account yet, but it is coming. So uh, as we uh, go forward to, uh, uh, to work in those areas, uh, we can continue that conversation. Thank you. Kim Dozier again. Um, revisiting one of my earlier questions and also um, paying off of um, what the general had said about thinking of this in terms of taking decades. If most of these demining projects are going to take decades, do we need to think about stopgap measures flooding the zone with training amateurs until you can get in to do the kind of work that the colonel was talking about? Yeah, could I? Please. I I, th I wouldn't. I mean, I, I, the question is a really good one, but I'm not sure I would describe it as amateurs. I think the issue is really about training indigenous people, about local people, and giving them, empowering them to resolve problems within their own communities. Iraqis, are an incredibly talented nation. You know, Syria, an incredibly talented and educated nation. These are people more than capable of learning these sophisticated techniques and dealing with these problems themselves if they're empowered to do it through good education and training. So I certainly wouldn't view this as about amateurs versus professionals. I do think there is a, dif a distinction to be made between expensive Western solutions and, and, and much more cost-effective local solutions. I do think what you need actually is a blend. You need some high-end, admittedly expensive, capability to deal with very sophisticated devices, but you need, I think in the end, budgets will run out unless you invest and indigenize your solution. And then you can begin to roll it out to very much larger numbers of uh, people within these affected countries. I think it's important, and I uh, agree with James, I think it's important in the context to understand what, you know, from a donor perspective, what the U.S. is funding. When you talk about Iraq and Syria, we, ha we do have uh, implementing partners uh, that are contract companies that we have funded to do uh, a lot of the very technical IED work in the urban environment that comes with a security uh, capability to, so that they can work in the security environment we're working in. That doesn't mean that we stopped funding international NGOs. We continue to fund NGOs in Iraq and in Syria to do work and in the United States in 2017 or using uh, 2017 funding, uh, also worked in about 45 other countries, or funded projects in 45 other, other countries. And all that work was, uh, or you know, the lion's share of that work was done 
through international NGOs who are employing uh, uh, local civilians from their communities to do that work and clear their communities. Thank you, Wardell. So we got, uh, sir, you had your hand up there with the, right there, please. Yeah, uh, right here first, and then we'll get to you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask a question from uh, General James, who is the new CEO for Hello Trust, regarding the challenges encountered with the humanitarian function in Afghanistan, specifically for the mining operation. Uh, in the old days in Afghanistan, the challenge was that encounter uh, in the Afghanistan, especially focusing on the security measure. In the old days, the mining operation and ICRC operation in Afghanistan, they had freedom of moving anywhere to go to Afghanistan to operate, to work, both under the control of the Afghan government as well as with the opposition. But nowadays, ICRC keep their role to go anywhere, to go and collect wounded people and do operate anywhere in Afghanistan. But the mining operation needed a lot of security assets. They, they are, depends on the Afghanistan security forces to establish security for them to go and do the demining. What is the, as a new CEO of Alotras, do you have any policy in, in order to obtain or to resource the same role of the, the NGO as, a, as it used to be, as a non-political or, uh, organization that there should it means give the same role of uh, as an to have freedom of movement and we are to go and work for that. Thank you very much, and it's a very topical question for us. So, um, I would say that uh, no Soviet was likely to object to us clear, clearing Soviet-era landmines because the Soviet Union had ceased to exist and Russia had left Afghanistan. So, uh, we have achieved uh, with other uh, operators. A remarkable success in Afghanistan. 80% of the uh, residual legacy threat of conventional landmines has now been cleared. The 20% that remains is still huge, but that is an enormous success. It was done because we had consent. Nobody objected. The problem we have now is that casualties are now being caused by IEDs, and of course IEDs are not laid by uh, the Soviet Union. They're laid by uh, armed opposition groups, notably the Taliban. And so the issue is do they want them removed or not? And we therefore need to uh, achieve local consent. We actually are not arming ourselves. We are not securitizing our solution. We are working with local communities. And by talking to people, by having an inherently Afghan operation, of the 3,500 people who work for Halo in Afghanistan, only four of them aren't Afghans. And the boss is an Afghan. And so they understand the country, they know who to talk to, and that is how the solution is achieved. And that's how we get access to those areas where we want to work. But even with all that negotiation, there will still be areas where um, the Taliban and others will not want us to work. And we're not going to try and go there. And there, there is only so much that an NGO can do before the solution uh, lies elsewhere. Do you think so that the DDR and DAR program was one of the main factors in the Taliban looking and demining operations, not the humanitarian function? I think there's a whole, there's a whole there's a whole lecture to begin, but in brief, I think the Taliban is not like ISIS. It's far less ideological. It's far more of a franchise. Many more of its local warlords simply want jobs for its young people and where they're and willing to give them those jobs. So I do think that uh, turning particularly young men of fighting age away from violence, uh, get, the, get the Kalashnikov out of the hand and put the, um, the mine detector in the hand is where we should be going. And we also want to employ women in Afghanistan. That may be a slightly revolutionary statement, but it's something we're increasingly focusing on. Interesting point. Sir, I promise you a question back there. The issue of corruption. Uh, what, what are you guys doing in terms of uh, mitigating corruption? Because at the end of the day, it's all about corruption. We've invested blood, treasure, and soul, and there's massive corruption. What are we going to do about it? Good question. Thank you. Who wants to jump in? I, I could just start yeah. by saying we uh, believe that one of the great side effects, un unintended side effects of the mine action cause is the degree to which the discipline and sound managerial structures of organizations like MAG or HALO um, obviate corruption. And we go to huge lengths to make sure that we are not corrupt and that the money that we're given by our donors is spent well. And um, we are also uh, helped in that regard 
um, by the very clear auditing that takes place because you as taxpayers would expect nothing less. And I think it's a really important aspect of what we do. Again, agreeing with James, uh, I think uh, part of your question is that uh, we don't give money directly to governments for demining purposes. We are giving it directly to implementing partners who we execute very high level of oversight, uh, audits, inspections, visits uh, to the site. So that's one of the ways that we uh, guard against the issue of corruption. Uh, I want to thank uh, our panel here. I'm uh, smarter than I was coming in. Uh, really appreciate everybody's comments and thank you very much.